the student visa process and preparing for departure to the United States. And all of our services are free of charge. Fact number five. One of the most well-known services that people visit Education USA at America for is the U.S. Admission Essay Review. In 2019, there were 416 essay review sessions conducted in Ad America. So, what are you waiting for? Plan your U.S. study early and don't worry, you're not alone because Education USA is here for you. Hello everyone, welcome back to Ad America TV. We welcome all of our audience members joining us online. We hope that you're doing well and stay safe. So for those of you guys who never know what Ad America is, Ad America is the US Embassy American Center here in Jakarta. And our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn more about the United States. So we have temporarily moved to a solid digital platform so you can enjoy us from the comfort of your own home. So for you guys who are joining us via Zoom right now, you can leave your questions at the chat box section or just simply say hi to our speakers and other participants. And please don't forget to use this feature wisely. And for those of you guys who are joining us via Ad America website, Twitter, Facebook, and Periscope Live, you can simply leave your questions at the comment box for each platform. And in this episode, we will discuss about 15 most frequently asked questions about studying in the US uh, in the USA. And before we begin, let's break the ice with a little game. So I have questions for tonight's event, and the question is: How many education USA centers are there in Indonesia? I repeat once again: How many education USA centers are there in Indonesia? You guys can answer the questions by commenting at our live on Facebook at Ad America. And stay tuned until the end of the program. We will give live shout outs for at the end for three people with correct answer. So other than that, don't forget to take a selfie and tag Ad America Instagram account. So, okay guys, let's just start the event. Without further ado, let me introduce you to today's speaker. Both are our lovely Ad America Education US advisor. So say hi to Santika Salim and Fina Al Atas. Hello guys. How are hi, you guys Vivi. doing? Pretty good. Thank you so much. How are you? Very good to see you guys online tonight. Yeah. How are you guys doing? I hope you guys are doing well. Yes. Yeah, we are good, Vivi. Thank you. Okay, so before we start the event, uh, maybe you guys can uh, share a little bit about uh, the event today, tonight. So we're basically, um, we have compiled 15 uh, most frequently asked questions that we uh, receive a lot from our advisees. And so, but don't worry if one of these questions is not in the um, upcoming video, everyone can actually ask us during our Q&A. All right, so are you guys ready to start the event tonight? We are ready. Okay, take it away. Thank you so much, Yuki. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome to Ad America TV. Um, but if you've been here before, um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Vina. I'm one of the advisors for Education USA based in Ad America, Pacific Place, Jakarta. But like what Fifi said earlier, we are currently going virtual. But it is really also exciting the fact that the whole Ad America team, we are still be able to provide you with a lot of amazing information. And of course, tonight, um, it's all about Education USA, about studying in the US. I'm very excited. And um, before we actually begin with the whole thing, um, we actually have uh, a number of questions in the polling, which um, you are more than welcome to help us um, answer some of the questions because we would like to know where are you guys watching this from and where, um, if you guys want to study, is it bachelor's degree or master's degree? So, Santika, can we actually have the polling out? And then um, we'll give you about a minute for you guys to um, answer it. All right. Polling starts now. Okay. We have a number of questions here. So if you guys want to take some time to um, try answer some of this question, please do so. All right, I'm gonna give a little bit of more time here. We got some answers coming in. And of course, we also have the chat um, box. So if you guys have any questions while we are playing the questions, the 15 most frequently asked questions, um, please do so. And then we'll be able to um, answer that after um, um, the, the video. All right. Okay, I guess we can end the polling and then we can actually see some of the answers here if Santika can help me with that as well. Okay, polling end and we are sharing the results. There you go. And oh wow, 90%. 90% of you guys wanted to study uh, master's degree. Great. Um, we have 6% doing PhD. Okay, good to know. We actually have um, some PhD related questions ready also. So that's good. 48% um, of you guys actually wanted to study um, later than fall 2021. There you go. I love it. So that means you guys are pretty much like start ahead so that's good um 42 percent is about uh 42 uh, percent of you guys wanted to study for next year um which is which now is the perfect timing to start um 10 percent of you guys want to start studying this year okay we can do that um 68 percent of you guys live in the jabodetabek area um that's good um 23 percent outside java we have an, a little um a uh, low number of people from Sumatra and Sulawesi. Hi guys, thanks so much for tuning in. And uh, look at that, 23% um, of you guys have actually done a an advising session with uh, either Santika or, or myself, um, I also either in person or, or, or virtual. But 77% of you guys have not, but would like to make an appointment. Well, you guys, we are here, uh, although we are doing everything virtually, right, Santika? But we are always standing by, just like as if we are in Ad America, because in Ad America, we never close. You're always every, available every day. And of, with Education USA, we are too, right? So basically, we are always on Zoom from 1 until 9 p.m. So um, one of us will basically standing by in the room. Okay, guys, thank you so much for the polling. I'm going to stop the polling here. And um, just in case this is your first time um, watching our Education USA program, I would like to give it to Santika to actually give a brief introduction about 
who we are, um, the kind of services that we provide. Um, so yeah, please, Santika. Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. So if you hear Fina mentioning my name and you don't know, uh, you haven't seen me before. So this is me. Um, uh, I'm with Fina in Education USA in Ad America and we are very happy to actually do this kind of event to interact with you just uh, to let you know that we are still here even if uh, we are going digital now. So um, if this is your first time, I want to let you know that um, Education USA is the U.S. Department of State. We network over 400 international student advising center in around uh, in this whole world. We have uh, centers in 170 countries or more. So in Indonesia alone, we have eight centers and 10 advisors in it. So if you remember the first question that Fifi gave to you, this is actually the hint for you. Um, we are going easy on you today and I uh, hope you can catch this one. So we have eight centers and 10 advisors, right? I'm going to uh, let you know all of them. So if you know anyone who wants to study in US and don't know where to start, uh, you can refer them to us, let them know, hey, Education USA exists in your area or near your city. So you can just contact us um, one email away for that, okay? So in Jakarta, we have two centers, uh, one in US Embassy Jakarta. We have David and Iqbal there for the advisors. And in Ad America, we have um, Fina and me, obviously. So we are located in uh, Pacific Place. Uh, Pacific Place Mall. If you never visit, please do visit us later when we are open. And we have two in Surabaya, um, in the U.S. Consulate General Surabaya. We have Husky, and one more is in Univers Universitas Erlangga Unair. Uh, we have Ambar there. So one more in Medan, uh, in U.S. Consulate Medan. We have Jeffrey. Uh, we have one in Malang, in Universitas Muhammadiyah. Uh, we have the advisor there named Zaki. He's very nice. So you can totally uh, go to him if you have any question. So the next one is Makassar. We are located in Universitas Fajar. We have Cendani there. And then the last one is in Banda Aceh. We are located in Universitas Islam on Air. Um, uh, Universitas Islam Negeri uh, Arani. Raniri. So we have Lilis there. She is very kind also. So you can just um, ask the questions away and everything to her. And I want to let you know that Education Yes, it gives you uh, kind of like uh, from beginning to the end of your planning to study to US. We do this by five steps. If you watch the video, you may know the five steps, but you don't really know uh, what are the steps in detail. So the first step is researching your options, whether you are still looking for schools or deciding what major you want to have. And the second step is financing your studies. If you have questions on scholarship, or anything like that and then um, the third one is completing your application this includes giving you input on your essay or CV or resume and any other documents that you want to submit for your university application the fourth one the fourth one is apply for your student visa so this is later on when you got accepted to many more universities you are deciding to choose one and then have to make your student visa. We are here to give you the step-by-step, -step, so don't worry on that. And the fifth one is actually the pre-departure orientation for you, for you to prepare your travel plan and everything else to make sure everything's good to go to US. Okay, so that's about Education USA. That's uh, one breath. <laughs> and um, if you guys have any questions, um, be it from the FAQ or not from the FAQ, uh, you can use the chat box. If you want to uh, turn on your video and uh, talk with us in the Q&A session, please let me know in the chat box because I will be there. I will be giving you uh, more information and you can copy paste them if you don't have time to memorize them directly, like the Zoom meeting ID and then our email. And also, if you uh, have questions, uh, for those of you in Zoom, again, use the chat box. Um, if you are streaming from the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, uh, use the comment box because uh, our team will pass the question to us. And we will play um, a video recording after this, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. 
So feel free to uh, take note and um, take note uh, and questions so you can uh, put it in in the, in the chat box later. All right, so I'll give it back to Fina. Hi, Fina. Hi, Sandika. Well, basically, you said everything. Um, I will basically just <laughs> echoing what you just said here. Um, again, guys, these are basically um, some of the questions that we have compiled. Um, as you may already know, or maybe not know, uh, not yet know, um, Education USA, we've been around for quite some time. And um, this is also my fifth year with Education USA. Um, I've been, you know, like um, assisting. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure um, to be able to assist a lot of Indonesians studying in the US. Um, and so these are some of the questions that we um, um, got asked a lot. Um, so I hope some of these questions, if not all of these questions, are also your questions. So um, feel free to take some notes. If not, then um, don't worry if, if there's some part that you want us to elaborate after the video. Um, we'll be here basically after that. So yeah, without further ado, actually enjoy. Um, and yeah, we'll see you after um, the video for more Q&A session. So enjoy the video. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in. And let's just start with question number one. So the question is, I don't feel confident to get into a highly selective university in the U.S. such as the Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, NYU, or UC Berkeley. But what are my chances of getting in? So let's agree with one thing first, that to get accepted to these universities is not easy. They are called highly selective universities with a reason, because their acceptance rate is less than 10%. And the fact that there are so many people out there applying for the same universities makes these universities highly competitive. But also a lot of us thought that just as long as I get good GPA, I'm pretty much good to go, right? In fact, it's not true at all. A lot of these universities, um, they're not just looking at your grades, but also your overall profile because they're reviewing your application holistically. So when an advisor coming in to Education OSA at America, the very basic questions that I that I ask my advisees is, where are you in your English? Especially that these universities, they are very particular with their English standardized test requirement, right? Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask like, bunch of other questions like why do you want to study in the US like what are your goals like why the specific universities what is it that you're going to do after you graduate so it's like your story you need to have like a really concrete um, clear goals of of why you want to study like in the US and all that right because we're going to put that in the essay so there are so many other things that we we can also like put a consideration on so for example like the standardized test like GRE or GMAT or SAT or ACT if you are still in high school um, but those are like the two main things that I usually like to ask first all right so the next question is my GPA is just okay and not that stellar. Can I still get into highly selective universities in the US? Uh, my simple answer is yes, as simple as that. And then a lot of my advisees kind of like, really, don't I need to get like really good grades to get, in, to get accepted? And then I would share with them one story to another of our advisees um, who had, you know, like a GPA between 3.0 to 3.4 and they could still get accepted to highly selective universities. Because remember, the key word here is holistic, right? That these universities, they are not just looking at your grades, but they're looking at everything. They really pay attention to their uh, to your essay, how, how, how great your story is. Um, they're looking at your GRE or GMAT, they're looking at your resume, the letter of recommendations, um, and, and so on, right? So don't worry, as long as you have like a really strong, um, um, profile other than Hi everybody, thanks for joining in and let's just start with question number one. So the question is, I don't feel confident to get into a highly selective university in the US such as the Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, NYU, or UC Berkeley. But what are my chances of getting in? So let's agree with one thing first, that to get accepted to these universities is not easy. They are called highly selective universities with a reason, because their acceptance rate is less than 10%. And the fact that there are so many people out there applying for the same universities makes these universities highly competitive. Competitive. But also a lot of us thought that just as long as I get good GPA, I'm pretty much good to go, right? In fact, it's not true at all. A lot of these universities, 
um, they're not just looking at your grades, but also your overall profile because they're reviewing your application holistically. So when an advisor coming in to Education OSA at America, the very basic questions that I that I ask my advisees is, where are you in your English? Especially that these universities, they are very particular with their English standardized test requirement, right? Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask like, bunch of other questions like why do you want to study in the US? Like what are your goals? Like why the specific universities? What is it that you're going to do after you graduate? So it's like your story. You need to have like a really concrete, um, clear goals of of why you want to study like in the US and all that, right? Because we're going to put that in the essay. So there are so many other things that we we can also like put a consideration on. So for example, like the standardized test, like GRE or GMAT or SAT or ACT if you are still in high school. Um, but those are like the two main things that I usually like to ask first. All right, so the next question is, my GPA is just okay and not that stellar. Can I still get into highly selective universities in the US? Uh, my simple answer is yes, as simple as that. And then a lot of my advisees kind of like, really, don't I need to get like really good grades to get, in, to get accepted? And then I would share with them one story to another of our advisees um, who had, you know, like a GPA between 3.0 to 3.4 and they could still get accepted to highly selective universities. Because remember, the key word here is holistic, right? That these universities, they are not just looking at your grades, but they're looking at everything. They really pay attention to their uh, to your essay, how, how, how great your story is. Um, they're looking at your GRE or GMAT, they're looking at your resume, the letter of recommendations, um, and, and so on, right? So don't worry, as long as you have like a really strong, um, um, profile other than your GPA. Basically, you want to balance everything out. So if you have like an okay GPA, that means you need to have like a really good essay or a really strong GRE and then stuff like that, right? So it's all about like balance and the fact that these universities, they review your application holistically. So again, they're not just looking at your GPA. What GRE or GMAT scores do I need in order to get accepted to my choice of universities in the USA, especially highly selective schools? Um, what is interesting about this course is oftentimes we couldn't find it on the university's websites. And that leaves us wondering what are the good scores then, right? What are the good scores that I need to aim? Um, the, e the easiest one to remember is since we're talking about like highly selective universities. So for example, at the GRE, um, there we have the GRE verbal and the GRE quant, right? A lot of us will find the GRE verbal or the English section very, very challenging. So a lot of us sometimes would end in, you know, like around like 150 out of 170 in the verbal section. So if you can actually, um, make like a really high score in the GRE quant or the, the math section that you will end up with like good scores. So for the GRE quant, um, if you can aim for 165 out of 170, I know that sounds like really high, but um, if you can get that, or even like if you can get like between 160 to 165, um, again, we're pretty much like good to go, right? Um, for the GMAT, however, because of their scoring system is basically they, they, they combine the, the two sections, the, the, the English and the math sections. So um, for you to get into like a really strong MBA programs or business programs in the US, you want to aim for um, seven, um, 700 out of 800 um, in the GMAT course. Uh, yes, it is very high. Do I see a lot of Indonesians get that scores? The answer is yes. So I'm pretty sure you can also get that scores. How do I write a good essay for my university application and how important is it? That's my favorite, favorite topic. And this is going to be very challenging for me to answer this in less than three minutes, but let's see. So how do you write a good essay? Um, as long as you have like a very clear goals of why do you take this specific program at this specific university and what is it that you're going to do after you graduate it, um, what are the issues here that needs to be fixed 
in Indonesia or something like that. And it doesn't have to be like a problem. Um, you can also like tell a story of like, um, you want to start something, you want to innovate something um, that you believe that when you start up, uh, apply that in Indonesia, that would be like really helpful. That's like one one example for, for doing that. And um, because again, like the universities in the US, especially when it comes to essay, they really, really, really read it. And again, the keyword is holistic, meaning that um, they're not accepting you just because you are a smart person, but they, they also want to accept you by knowing who you are, you know? So it's, it's, it's very personal approach on their end. So that's something that we can put in in the essay, right? And the next question is how important is it? It is very important because then again, it's, it's they, they really see that as something personal. Um, so you don't want to basically write an essay where hundreds of other applicants out there might say the same thing. So you want to basically create a memorable um, type of essay, something that they're not just like read it for the first paragraph and then they think, oh my God, this is like the 50th time of me reading the same story over and over again. And then they might skip it, right? They might skip to another applicant. Um, but if you have like a like a one story where you believe that no other applicants can actually write the same thing, which is very hard, it is, but it's definitely possible, um, then they will kind of like going to keep reading your essay until the end, right? So again, that's um, also like, um, I would say the most popular service that we provide here um, with Education West at America. And I, and I love reading essays. So if you have like the draft, um, please send them in and then we can, you know, discuss more. But then again, something to remember is um, because this topic is very, very important um, and U.S. admission essays completely different than other essays outside the U.S. So a lot of us kind of like find it very challenging when it comes to like writing this type of essays. Um, but the good news is here in Education USA at America, we provide this kind of um, presentation, this kind of like event every single month um, where I would, you know, go go ahead and tell you a lot of um, things about like um, tips to write an essay, um, how important is it and stuff like that. All right. So this is a good one. The application process to universities seems more simple in other countries than the United States. And a lot of my friends prefer European countries or Australia for this reason. Why do you think that is? Um, I can basically like answer this for hours and hours, but the shorter version of this is ask yourself, do you prefer to go with the easy way of applying or the hard complicated time consuming of the application process, but it's going to be worth it at the end. If you're the second type, let's talk. Because like seriously, right? Like be realistic when it comes to like applying to US universities. Yeah, it's not easy. It's very time consuming. That's why um, we always like urge people to start very early in the days to start your application process. It's very um, stressful at some point where you would come to Education USA at America, I would review your essay, but then I keep giving you like, you know, like ask you to write a revision to another revision, right? It's, it's, it's stressful at some point, but I promise you, it's going to be very, very worth it, right? Because again, like when you want to study in the US, it's not just you getting the degree, getting the knowledge, but it's about like the innovation of that specific program and just like the whole experience, something that I would say you wouldn't get it everywhere else, right? And again, this is not me just like simply saying it. This is something that a lot of alumni, US alumni, even like some current students can back me up on this. I'm overwhelmed with so much information when looking at some US universities websites that I want to apply to. What exactly are the requirements to study in the United States and where do I start? TOEFL first, GRE first, or essay? 
Um, yes, it can actually be quite overwhelming when you visit the university websites and there's just like so many different sections and all that. But um, you will want to start with like a section that's usually called admission. And then um, once you kind of like familiarize, familiarize yourself with like that section, Practically, like all the information is there. They have a, the, the the due date. They have like um, usually they have like a checklist of the requirements, right? So, and what are the requirements? Um, from one university to another can be varied, but um, the general one is definitely your transcript. So if you want to study bachelor's degree, that's going to be your high school transcript or um, college transcript if you want to study master's or, or PhD. And then um, they're going to ask you for TOEFL or IELTS. Um, TOEFL is definitely acceptable in 100% of universities in the US because it's coming from the US. Um, but still, there are still a few number of universities that do not accept IELTS. But nowadays, there are so many universities in the US that accept IELTS. So that's that. And then they're asking you to provide standardized tasks. There are some programs they, that might not ask that standardized test. So you want to pay attention to that. So what do I mean by standardized test? So it can be either GRE or GMAT um, for master's or PhD program or SAT or ACT if you're still in high school and you want to study bachelor's degree. All right. And um, they are going to also ask you to write an essay, another documents that is really, really important, right? And then if you want to do master's degree, they're going to ask you to submit your resume or CV. There are two different things um, and you want to pay attention to that as well. And then um, letters of recommendation is um, another thing. All right, and um, where should you start first? Is it TOEFL first or GRE first? Um, different students have like different preferences. For example, um, we know like some alumni who have shared with us where they said, um, I actually go ahead with the GRE first because knowing that the level of English that they have is quite high. Once, you know, they kind of like um, get good scores in the GRE, they found it very, very easy to do TOEFL. Um, but then there are also like another p p type of um, people who they kind of like want to test first where they are on their English. And that is kind of like the very basic step or question that I usually ask people, like where are they in their English? Because if we can, if, if, if we're still not there yet in terms of like our English level, it's going to be very hard to move on to the next step. It's going to be very hard to start with your GRE or GMAT or SAT or ACT. Um, and it's going to be very, very challenging for you to write your essay because obviously that's going to everything going to be in, in English, right? So English is a very basic, uh, I would say the very basic step. But whether or not you want to start with the GRE or TOEFL, it's, it's definitely up to you. Um, probably like ask yourself like, where are you exactly in your English without taking the task? You know, like are you can you speak can you use English? comfortably in a day-to-day -day basis, for example. Um, and then, yeah, once you kind of like figure that out, you are, you can basically like also like do essay at the same time while you're, let's say, preparing for your GRE. How early do I need to start my application to U.S. universities? Um, two years before the program starts. I know it sounds like a crazy amount of time to prepare, but the reason is because, so for example, if you want to start your program in fall 2021, which is next year, sometimes like in August or September of 2021, um, there are a number of universities that um, already set their deadline as early as this coming October or November of this year, right? So then from that deadline, you want to take like another one year, which is like sometimes late last year um, to kind of like start your um, um, compiling all the application, right? I know for some kind of like really like one year to prepare everything. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes people can actually do it like in three months or even like six months. But to be safe, you want to have like a, like one year to prepare all this because we don't want to, um, let's say you're setting a timeline three months before the deadline to compile everything only to figure out later on that you need to have like a lot of revision in the essay. You need more time to 
um, prepare for the GRE, maybe you want to retake the GRE test or something like that, right? And of course, like especially if you are still trying to improve your English in terms of like the TOEFL and the GRE uh, uh, or IELTS, you definitely need even like more time, right? And that's also like a reason why that's kind of like the basic step or like the basic question that I um, um, ask my advisees, um, wh which is like, where are you in your, in your English? Because then that's going to be like very challenging um, if you are not there yet in terms of like the English level to move on to the next step to the GRE or GMAT um, or SET or ACT and, and, and let alone the essay. So yeah, to be safe, two years before the program starts. So I have one last question before I pass it over to Santika to answer the rest. Um, I would like to pursue a PhD in the United States. What are the main things I need to know, such as how to get a scholarship? So I would like to share with you guys who wants to study PhD some good news um, because there are so many funding provided by the university when it comes to PhD uh, uh, program. Right. Um, but then again, as we may already know, as, as, as a lot of a lot of you may already know that there are two full ride um, scholarship from the government of um, the U.S. and Indonesia. So you got Fulbright and then you got LPDP. Right. Um, if you want to start, if you want to try applying for those scholarship, by all means, please do that. Um, but if you want to also like just go ahead and. Um, communicate with the universities, ask about some possible funding, how much funding that they can give you, is it going to be covered, basically like the whole study, then that's already like great to start too, right? So basically you don't need like the other type of scholarship if the universities can already cover that. Um, another thing that you want to kind of like be aware of, um, the fact that doing a PhD in the US it can take like a long time. Um, sometimes it's like a minimum of like five years to seven years. So um, you might want to kind of like consider that. But if that is something that you really look forward to, then go ahead, right? Um, and then in terms of like the application process, um, it's not that like um, it's not that difference with master's degree. Uh, they will still require you to submit pretty much like the same like your TOEFL, GRE, or GMAT and um, um, essay. But the additional document is that you may want to also like have with you now is the research proposal. Um, and also like in terms in terms in terms of. Um, finding the universities is also kind of like different with master's degree because like with master's degree, um, I would like recommend, like I would ask my advisees to like do a lot of like deep research about that programs and making sure that um, that specific program will get you where it is that you wanna have like in the future, right? When it comes to like a PhD, it's similar like that, but you kind of like wanna have like a, a somewhat personal approach with the professors because when doing PhD you're going to um, work together with with a professor or two right so it's kind of like testing the water first before applying by contacting the professor start um, introduce yourself and share with him or her your research proposal and then see if they are kind of like interested do you have to do that um, actually no but that's um, one of the common ways um, of prospective students prospective PhD students um, do when it comes to like you know applying to US University so once the professors kind of like get back to you and they they show their interest then you can move on to like um, apply for that specific university so it's not so much looking at like on the website like oh if i want to do my phd in environmental management or something like that you're not like so much looking at like the ranking for that specific program but you can start from there um but then it's, it's again like it's, it's it's more like a personal approach through to to the professors trying to like find um some professors who you can think in the beginning before you contacting them that I think this professor will be interested in my research, you know, or something like that. But um, yeah, again, it's like this is it's it's a good um, time for you to start considering doing PhD in the U.S. because of again, like of course we all know, like studying in the U.S. is not um, it's not cheap, right? But um, um, yeah, for PhD, there are so many universities um, 
in the US where they will be happy to cover your um, study. So that's it from me, but don't worry, we still have seven more questions, um, which Sampika will take it over. All right, thank you, Fina. And the next question from my part is for graduate degree programs. Apart from the Fulbright and LPDP or LPDP, are there any other scholarships available? So the answer to this million dollar questions is yes, there might be some funding or grants provided by the university. Usually it's in the form of you working as a research or the, a professor assistant and they will waive your tuition fee. Um, they don't usually call it a scholarship and oftentimes they don't provide this funding opportunities on their website. So you will have to contact the department directly. And any other questions that um, is really specific, um, you need to contact them directly, especially on opportunities, right? And note that the smaller the department and the more research or more research focused your program is, they will have more funding. So programs like MBA and LLM um, may find a hard time to land on such funding opportunities. Um, and the good news for PhD candidates is um, if you got accepted, uh, a lot of the PhD programs in the US will actually automatically waive your tuition costs and receive a stipend that is enough for your accommodation. Next question is, what is considered a good number of universities to apply to? Is three too few and six too many? So the good answer to this is there's no limit on how many universities you can apply to United States. And we always recommend advices to apply to one or two dream university, one or two target university, one or two safety university. Dream university are those that have acceptance rate below 10% and target university is between 30 and 70% and safety university is above 70% acceptance rate. So three is the recommended minimum that you apply to and six is about the right amount. So the more university that you apply to United States, the more chance you can get accepted to any university in United States. Now that we have done 10 FAQs, let's move on to standardized test questions. The first one is, my English is not that good. Can I still apply and get accepted to U.S. universities? So the answer is actually depending on what your TOEFL and your IELTS score is. And different universities will have different standard on this. So for better degree, we always recommend you to aim for um, at least 79 points or above on TOEFL IBT or 6.5 points on overall for the IELTS. For master degree or PhD, let's aim for 100 points or above for TOEFL IBT and 7 overall points or greater for the IELTS. Okay, moving on to the next question and it's still about standardized test. Can I apply to US universities without the GRE, GMAT, SAT or ACT test or are these standardized tests mandatory? So for master degree, yes, it is possible and it is perfectly, completely normal if you prefer to apply for some programs in U.S. universities that do not need GRE or GMAT test. Um, in fact, more and more universities today no longer uh, require the applicants to take the GRE test. Um, more and more universities and um, or business schools offer flexibility to let the applicants submit GRE instead of GMAT score. Um, as for bachelor degree, SAT and ACT are applicable. Um, unless you want to start at a two years institution called the community college, um, most four years university still require you to take SAT or ACT. But if your question is, is there any four year university that do not require SAT or ACT? Yes, there is. Okay, let's say you will need the standardized test in order for you to apply to the university. Your next question could be, how do I prepare for the TOEFL or the IELTS test, uh, GRE, GMAT, SAT, or ACT test? Um, is it best to learn on my own using the books and online resources, or do I need to enroll in a prep class or intensive class? So the answer to this and the right combination to this is actually depends on each individual because different people have different style of learning in order for them to effectively and efficiently master something. 
Um, I will give a short example of let's say your friend or your colleague um, they only learn using the book and they take the test they get good results and you are doing the same way but you don't get the good result this may be because you have a different style of learning you may need more interaction in order for you to learn better so maybe you will need a classroom where your friends and teacher is teaching um, so this is one of the questions where we don't have the answer for you and uh, you will need uh, to test it out on yourself and therefore preparing ahead and giving yourself time to explore is very crucial. So all of these methods um, from the book, the online resources and the prep course could work and it depends on how compatible they are on your style of learning. You can also combine um, your style of learning and using different resources. So we recommend you to use both books and online resources because they kind of complement each other. The books cannot have the audio file that you need to learn for your listening part and the online resources most likely to be able to offer you that part. Um, and you need to find yourself uh, to self-study on this but if you find it very hard uh, to study on your own and getting enrolled in a prep class or an intensive class is actually a good way for you to learn okay so the next one is what are some tips to get good score in GRE and GMAT test um, most of us Indonesian will find the verbal section in GRE and GMAT very very challenging so try to do really really good in your quantitative section so it will show your strength instead of your weakness and boost your score um, do online simulation tests because the real tests are online you want to familiarize yourself with the online mode and not freaking out on the real test and the next one is quite basic is actually giving yourself more time because like I have mentioned, you may want to explore your learning style and having more time means you can have more practice. Standardized tests are um, kind of like the game of um, practice because the more practice you have, you're more familiar with the types um, and style of the question and you can develop your own tips and tricks. And if you took the test once and you did not reach your target, don't give up on it because it is completely normal and common to retake this kind of test. All right, now we are on to the last question. Can I work in the United States after I graduate? So to answer this question is actually yes, because you are allowed to apply for OPT or optional practical training for each degree that you got in the United States. So the OPT, if you got it, you are allowed to uh, apply for jobs and if you get the job, you are allowed to work uh, full time like the internship all under your student visa. So um, your job or the work has to do with your field of study or the degree that you earn. Um, and the duration, it really depends on what kind of degree that you got. If you got non-STEM, then you can uh, have up to one year. If you got STEM, you can get up to three years. Now, you have a question uh, on what is STEM, right? So STEM is Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics degree. All right, there you have it. All of our most frequently asked questions about studying in the United States. We hope these are helpful to you to plan your studies in the United States. All right, so thank you guys for watching our pre-recorded video. So those are our 15 most frequently asked questions. Um, actually, we actually have a lot, um, but for tonight's sessions, let's um, do 15. Um, and it's really interesting because we have so many other questions with us here, right, Tantika? And um, I would actually like to just go ahead and pick one of the questions here. Um, so I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, let's start with a um, question from Iksan, Iksan Gaming. Um, pertanyaannya adalah, apakah lulus 6 atau 7 tahun mempengaruhi masuk perguruan tinggi di Amerika Serikat, khususnya masuk di University Ivy League? Thank you. So basically the question is, uh, if, if you graduate for six to seven years, um, although it's not really clear, do you mean, so for example, you graduate, you did bachelor's degree for six to seven years and then now you want to do master's after that? Because normally bachelor's degree can be done in 
uh, in four years, right? Um, but um, it might raise some questions for the university, that's for sure, uh, if that's the case, because they probably um, wondered what took you so long to actually finish a degree. Um, so I would actually so stop I would with actually that question. With that question. But, but let's uh, start. But if you if you uh, want to ask more questions about that, um, again, uh, feel free to contact us via Zoom or um, email. All right. Um, we have another one from Hanum Rahmi Putri. Too bad we don't have education USA in Riau. Can I contact the advisor and get through my application progress online? So the the answer is definitely yes. So technically. All Education USA advisors in Indonesia, we are covering um, anybody who is in Indonesia. So even though you are in Rio, you can definitely contact one of our advisors um, in Medan, which is Jeff is there. Um, but then, of course, um, you can also come to us, um, um, either to Santika or myself. Again, um, like we mentioned earlier, um, we are basically available every day um, through Zoom from 1 until 9 p.m. And um, I have the ID here just to kind of like share with you guys if you want to um, ha have a talk with us, have a chat with us during Zoom. The Zoom ID is 276-124-396, okay? Um, I repeat it again, 276-124-396. If you don't get that, um, feel free to also email us, um, and then we'll 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 give you um, again the, the 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 Zoom ID. All right, um, let's go with Muslimin Budiman Satrianto. Um, which university in in the USA that most taken by Indonesian student for a master's degree? Oh wow, okay. Um, I don't have that data with me, but I would say at least here in Education West at America, our advices are pretty much everywhere. So there is no particular um, uh, or specific universities. It's, we are basically everywhere from the West Coast to East Coast to uh, Midwest um, to South part of the US. So we are basically like everywhere. So because again, like uh, when it comes to studying in the US, um, it's not so much about the name of the universities, the, 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 the brand of that universities, the universities that we often time hear about, but it's all about the program itself, right? Which, uh, in fact, um, basically all, a lot of universities in the US out there um, that can um, uh, uh, offer like a good program for you. Okay, um, we have a question here from Denisa um, regarding funding my study. What are the difference between scholarship, loan, and grants? This is a really good question. Um, so the easiest way to understand this, when especially when you start um, um, visiting some university websites, everything related to funding, um, they are called under the umbrella of financial aid. That is also something that a lot of us, um, a lot of our advisees ask that question. So what is financial aid? Can I get financial aid? So normally with financial aid, so the umbrella is financial aid, but then they have another type of funding. There are scholarship, there are loans, and there are grants. Loans, um, the majority of, if not all the universities in the U.S., when it comes to loans, they are only available for um, a U.S. citizen. So unfortunately, it's not available for uh, international students. Um, when it comes to scholarships and grants, they are almost the same. So for example, when it comes to master's degree, um, a lot of a lot of our advice is asking if there are um, scholarship available for a master's degree level. Um, oftentimes, these universities they don't really call it scholarship, and also oftentimes they don't put that information on the websites. But they have um, what they can also call grant. Um, so, for example, you can apply as a um, GRA or graduate research assistant or teaching assistant. So you're working while you're studying and um, some of the grants that the universities are offered can be varied. Sometimes they can waive your tuition, meaning that you don't have to pay a tuition. But in return, because you're working, they are going to give you um, 
Um, they call it many things, uh, many terms, allowance or stipends. But that is something that is a lot of um, um, our students actually shared with us that the amount of that can be quite enough to cover pretty much everything, like your meals and and, and your um, uh, apartment rents and all of that, right? So, um, so yeah, scholarship and grants can be kind of like pretty much like the same thing, but um, some universities can um, use different term. Um, let's go ahead with, we have Ifana Krisnauli here. The question is, how many scholarship available for master's degree? Um, I actually just discovered that. So a lot of these universities, um, they don't really call it um, scholarship, um, but usually they are in, um, the funding is um, where you would apply for a position. And, and oftentimes when it comes to master's degree, the type of um, position that you can apply is either, you know, like as, as, as a graduate research assistant or teaching assistant. Um, or something that I can also share with you guys is um, what we see often, often when it comes to our advisees who receive this kind of funding is this type of fundings are available more on programs that is um, that are research heavy or a program where the whole department is not that um, crowded. Uh, how do I say it? So something like if you, so for example, like MBA, MBA, they are accepting hundreds of students and I have not heard um, one of uh, specific MBA program where they actually offer um, this position so far, but um, the, 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 um, the more the, pro the program itself is very, very like niche, very like research heavy, um, the more you, will, you would find um, a position uh, for you to cover everything. Okay, mm, Christian Sukan Reborn, could you tell me after master's lecture in America on my Fulbright scholarship that I could apply for the same scholarship for the SPGA program? Um, so if I get that question correct, uh, the question is basically, so if you are a Fulbright um, candidate and then can you actually um, continue doing a PhD? That is definitely a question that you would um, ask the Fulbright team directly, because this is a very technical question. Um, but my understanding is um, with the J1 program, once you are finished with your degree, you have to come back um, um, for a certain of years before you can actually coming back, uh, continue your, your study. But, but then again, that is definitely something that you would like to um, ask directly to the Fulbright team. Okay. Agus Prayudi here is asking, my biggest challenge, I think, to build good experience and achievements because scholarship awardees usually have good achievements and experience, but I don't know yet how far I must get. Um, that is a somewhat tricky question to answer because what do you mean by good experience and achievements, you know, because... Um, Technically, we also see a number of students. Um, but then here's the game. Like when, you, when you're talking about like good experience and achievements, is it like your like working experience or achievements as in like, the, like your grade? Um, it's really hard to answer without really knowing your whole story. So um, it's, it's a tricky question here. But um, I would say, yeah, absolutely. You definitely want to build a, a good profile when you, when you um, want to apply to U.S. universities. But it's not always about like experience and achievements, but it's also about um, what is it that what is your intention of 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 continuing your studies in the U.S. Um, so again, that is definitely something that we want to put in the essay. You don't really want to put your past experience or your um, great achievements in the essay because that is definitely something that we can actually provide in the transcript or in the resume or CV. But essay is definitely something that you want to um, create something new um, in a way, you know, more like explaining what is it, what is your intention of, 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 of continuing the study, okay? Um, we have Hanum Rahmi Putri here. Does Education USA assist 
their their advisee from the first to the last step of the study preparation. How much does the advisee have to pay? Thanks. Um, so Hanum, um, the good news is everything related to Education USA and everything related to Ad America, um, there is no funding um, at all. There is no funding that you need to pay. All of our services are free of charge. So this is something that um, I would love to have people know more of us. Um, the fact that Education USA is here, um, we are assisting everyone who wants to study in the US every step of the way. And again, all of our services are free of charge. So um, I, I hope I answer your first question as well. So that, mean, that means when whenever you come to um, Education USA uh, to have an advising session with, with Education USA advisors, um, you can be on, on, on any level. Um, it can be when you are still thinking about studying in the U.S., but you're not sure if you should study in the U.S. So um, on any on any level, that's totally fine. We, um, uh, we also have like a, an advisee where they are coming in for the first time and they already have their essay, for example. But so yeah, and uh, we have we, we provide you with five steps. So we start with research or options. That's a very basic one, and then we have um, finance your studies. We can talk about like a number or a number of options of of, of, of funding. Um, in the U.S. universities, and then we move on to completing your applications, which is just in the step three. And then step four is applying for your student visa um, after you get accepted. And then step the last step is pre-departure orientation. So basically, we're doing um, everything here for you guys. And every, again, everything is for uh, uh, it's free of charge. Um, Danny Octaviani, my question is, does work experience is also become consideration consideration when we apply the university? And if it does, how much it's actually uh, matter? Um, not actually a lot of university programs in the U.S. Um, mention specifically whether or not they are, uh, whether they're looking for an applicant to have working experience, um, except probably for MBA. So for example, if you want to study MBA, um, a lot of the universities, if not all of the universities, they are asking for you to actually at least have about two, three years of working experience. But um, other than that, um, is it possible for you to actually apply for a master's degree in the U.S. without working experience? I I would say yes um, but then that may be kind of like you also want to think about um, if you are planning to apply for a um, L uh, LPDP or Fulbright um, you might kind of uh, you might um, compete with other applicants who might have like more, more working experience um, Muslimin Budiman Satrianto here asking, mostly Dream School category is a private university. Can you guys share to us if there is any Dream Schools for state university? And what is main what is the main, main differences between private um, and state university in the US? Um, that is a really good question. For Dream University, I believe there are some state or public universities. So um, private is um, swasta, kalau di Indonesia, if Indonesian is it's, it's called swasta, yeah. Um, state is public atau negeri. Um, the main difference is, um, the one that is very, very obvious is definitely the, um, the tuition cost. Um, we can definitely assume that the private university will cost a lot um, compared to the private university, uh, co compared to the uh, public or state university. Um, also, the size of the campuses might also um, differences uh, different. Um, for example, the private uni universities, uh, some of them may not be that um, the student body might not be as many as um, the the public universities, but but then again, in terms of like the quality of the educations, um, it is uh, or should you go to you know like private better than the than state? There's no such thing. It's always come down to picking the right programs, not so much about um, um, the, the the type of the university itself. Okay. Um, Lindry here asking, I'm working on my application, what is official transcript and how to get it? Um, official transcript, um, if I may speak in Bahasa for a while here, so official transcript itu um, uh, ijazah yang sudah di 
kopian ijazah yang sudah dilegalisir. So a lot of a lot of people thought when it comes to official transcript is you're submitting your only and an original transcript. Um, it is still original, but it's, it's still kind of like a copy, but you get a stamp from the campus. So that's what it means by official transcript. So you may want to um, contact the um, prof- uh, the university for that. Okay. Um, Elsa, how about LSAT? Since people are more familiar with GRE, GMAT, SAT, or ACT, then how do you advise for those who are preparing for LSAT? That's a really good question. Uh, the reasons why we don't really mention LSAT because not a lot of our advisees or not a lot of Indonesians actually um, need to take LSAT. Um, so LSAT is a task for if you want to study, uh, if you want to go to a, a law school, but only if you graduated from a bachelor's degree with non-law degree. So for example, like in the US, there is no uh, S1 hukum, right? Di US itu tidak ada. Okay, jadi a lot of people, so their first degree of law school is after they graduate with a bachelor's um, degree. Okay, and um, so yeah, so and, and, and a lot of Indonesians when it comes to studying um, for um, law school in the US, it's called LLM. So LLM is a program, it's a law program um, for those who graduated with a law degree um, in bachelor's. Okay, so um, I believe Santika here wanted to give some comments. Yep, so we are going to have the next question uh, from Rahman Nasir, and uh, yeah. I think he or she wants to turn on the video. Hi, oh, Rahma. Cool. Looking for Rahma. Rahma. We have Rahma here. Rahma? All right, maybe while we are waiting for Rahma, um, do we want to go ahead? Maybe Santika, do you want to go ahead and um, is there any, if there's any questions, other questions or? Yeah. You want me to keep going? So, <laughs> yeah, Rahma's question was, is there any further explanation on Ad America YouTube channel related to Fulbright scholarship, uh, talk to Fulbright alumni do, during this pandemic? Is there any further explanation on at America YouTube channel related Fulbright scholarship? I believe we had had um, a Fulbright scholarship related event in the past when we are still in in at America. Um, I think it was sometimes um, late last year, if I'm not mistaken. We can definitely check it um, for you, Rahma. But um, that session was really, really great because we invited. Um, a number of Fulbright um, alumni, um, including a Fulbright student uh, as well. Um, are we going to have another sessions about Fulbright um, in the future? Absolutely. So please stay tuned uh, um, on that. All right. So, so yeah. Um, another question is still about uh, LPDP and Fulbright, Vina. Um, yes. It's from yes. Bagas Budi Permana. Is yep. Bagas here? Bagas want to turn on the video, maybe? Uh, I think he's listening, but... Okay, so his question okay. is, um, is there any further explanation? Sorry, uh, LPDP or Fulbright require the awardee to back to Indonesia after study. So if we want to work in, Amer- in America, it means we must uh, go back to Indo first for a couple of years. Can you explain it? Okay, so I'll try to, okay, so that's a really good question. Um, I think Santika answered that on that last part with OPT, yeah. So here's the thing with, yeah. um, with so if you want to, if you are a Fulbright candidate, you are going to receive a, um, a student visa under J1. So there are two different type of student visa, J1 and F1. There's also another one, M1, it's for vocational studies, but we don't really see that a lot. So usually what we um, share with our advisees are those two types, the J1 and the F1. For Fulbright, technically you are going to be under J1. And um, Fulbright, again, this is something that you also uh, can ask directly to Fulbright team, but they do have a two-year home residency. Um, So meaning that after you graduate um, with Fulbright, you will have to come back to... um, 
um, um, Indonesia. Um, with LPDP, however, um, what we are seeing is um, there are a number of LPDP awardees with a J1. There are also a number of LPDP awardees with an F1. So with an F1 student visa, that's the one that is more common um, when it comes to studying in the U.S. as an international student. So with an F1 type visa, there is what we called OPT or optional practical training. So actually with J1, there is also what they call AT or academic training. Um, but then again, we are more familiar with F1. Um, so with, with J1 for that type of academic training, whether or not you can do it, you will definitely want to discuss that with the Fulbright team. But what we know with F1 is that once you graduate, so every time you receive a degree, a degree from U.S. universities, you are allowed to apply for an for an OPT. So OPT is still under the student visa, so it's not a working visa. You are still um, technically a student, although you are already graduated. Um, the status you are still you are still under like the student visa. So with OPT, they are allow you to work related to your degree only related to your degree. So you can't work on OPT, for example, you graduated with um, um, electrical engineering and then you're working as a barista. You can't do that, it's, it's not allowed, it's, it's against the, um, um, the rule. So you have to work that is related to your major. Um, you can get um, 12 months of um, OPT, but if you are under STEM program, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, you can actually get uh, a total of three years of OPT, okay? And um, with LPDP, again, that is also something that you want to discuss with the LPDP team. Um, but what we have seen so far, we have our some of our advisees who are who are in the U.S. and already graduated under the LPDP uh, LPDP scholarship, and then they got the OPT. They would come back home to during the summer or or something like that. But at some point, they are um, informing the LPDP team that hey, I am going to do an OPT in the U.S. So that's, again, that is definitely something that you can um, discuss with the um, LPD team. All right, Santika, do we have another question? question. Can you, un yeah. Mm -hmm. Come again, yep. sorry. Uh, so my connection is not that good. I'm so sorry for this. <laughs> um, it's quite technical today. Um, the next question we have um, is from M3 Sutrisno, which I already answered in the chat box. So please check the chat, bo uh, ch chat box uh, for uh, M3 Sutrisno Gaus. And then the next question is from Tommy Aditya. How can I get additional loans to study in the States? Do you have recommendations for good student loans? So thank you so much for the question, Tommy. But um, something that I would like to share with you that when it comes to loans um, coming from the universities, unfortunately, that is something that is only available for um, the US citizen. So unfortunately, it's not available for international students. Okay, I think we have two more the next here. One is from Johanna Francisca Dania. What universities in the US which don't require GRE for Master Public Administration? Um, okay. Typically, I will answer this question by telling the student to actually uh, find out what are the universities that you are interested in and to find whether they ask for um, the GRE or not. But if you are specifically looking for those that do not need it, then um, we don't really have the list, right, Fina? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, um, um, it's, it's very normal that if you want to study in the US, but you are looking for campuses that uh, or programs that do not require GRE. Um, um, although, however, we don't have that list. So um, for you to find that out would be um, 
uh, go to the universities itself, or maybe there, I'm pretty sure maybe there, there are some kind of um, like a forum online where there are a group of um, people who are interested um, with the same program and maybe they can share with you some of the schools that do not require um, the GRE, but unfortunately we don't have the list. All right, we are moving on to the last question, Vina. So this uh, student or advisee who is joining us here in Zoom is quite interested in our Zoom uh, meeting room. So um, his question um, is uh, from Agus Prayudi in Zoom. Is the Zoom available at any time and even after the pandemic? So yes. Um, Zoom will be quite available because uh, before this uh, pandemic and uh, COVID happened, we also do online advising, but it's uh, quite uh, limited to people who are not in, uh, you know, the vicinity of uh, visiting our uh, center, the Education USA at America. So we do the online advising, like let's say advising from Papua. Uh, so yeah, definitely, yes, uh, we will be available, but maybe not from 1 until 9 p.m. every day after the pandemic. Am I right, Fina? Anything to yeah. add? Yeah, so, but yeah, no, definitely, we are, we are now available. Um, um, so technically, we are, even, even when, before the, the, this difficult um, times, we are always available every day in America, in person, most likely, but um, um, yeah, we are now moving virtual, but we are also available every day. So again, um, there are two ways for you to, to um, get in touch with us. You can simply email us first if you want um, to kind of like, you know, if you want to book an appointment and stuff like that. But if you want to just kind of like go ahead, um, logging in into Zoom, um, again, our room ID is 276-124. 396 we are always available from 1 until 9 p.m and um yeah and and and, and we've seen um a number of advisees um so for example I, I i read a number of essays already for for those who want to study for fall 2021 there are a number of advisees who are um, still in the very um, early stage of their application process so they're simply just sharing where they are and 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 wanting to know like what are the other things that they need to um, prepare but yeah Agus you are more than welcome and for everyone else as well um, please um, um, come to zoom and talk to us and share with us your US study plan because we are definitely here so okay and we actually have um, Anton who would like to ask a question as well um, and I believe Anton wants to turn uh, his video on and asking directly to us. Hello. We have Anton now. Hi, Anton. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. And I would like to say hi to Fina and Santika. And uh, quickly, hi. my question. Um, I, I would like to go and study in the U.S., but I, I know what I'm, I want to study but I don't know what university I should go to. Is there any official rankings or um, just a list that I can go through to go from the top schools, the middle schools, and then the lower tier schools? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anton. That is another yet yeah, good questions, and I would say a really good questions for us to end uh, um, the session. So yeah, um, is there an official ranking system? This is something that is really interesting because actually, um, from the US government itself, there is no official ranking system when it comes to like universities. So actually those ranking systems that um, oftentimes we hear about, it's actually coming from a third party organization. So for example, like US News or QS ranking, and there are so many more um, in the internet. Um, I we, like we don't really rely so much on ranking, but do I use it when it comes to like an advising um, with my advisees? I would say yes, just to the point for you to um, kind of like get the list of the campus. But it doesn't mean that. Um, so, for example, there is this third party organization that provide a ranking for a specific program. Um, I would use that list, but I'm not going to rely on that list per se. So it doesn't mean that if they put number one as University of A, for example, that means that there's that is going to be your number one choice. That is not how uh, uh, we would not how we. Um, uh, 
uh, give a suggestion to our advisees. Instead, get that list and then you want to do deep research from one university to another until you actually realize which program that is best for you. So that's why when it comes to studying in the US, you have to be very clear first, what is it that you want? So you can't just basically apply just because, just because for example, MBA is a, it's the popular program and I think it sounds really cool if I can come back to Indonesia with an MBA degree but then at the same time you're not really sure why do you want to take MBA for right so once you kind of like realize that look I want to study for example I got a student yesterday and she wants to study microbiology and then she has a specific university that she mentioned and then I would ask her why that specific university and then she said oh because I did some research and that in that university there's this specific lab um, that is really get in line with what I would like to do research on or and then there's this number of courses that is provided by the universities and that is really like what I need to take something that I don't or something that I couldn't find it from other campuses. So that's that's what we usually uh, advise our um, advisees when it comes to like finding the right university. I know it can be sometimes um, um, uh, confusing and, 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 and time consuming when it when it comes to finding these universities but then again that's also something that we can help you um, in the in, in uh, with you know like helping you navigate um, um, the universities and, and maybe like helping you finding the list of the universities for that specific program all right thank you so much Anton I hope it answers um, your questions and uh, if we couldn't get um, uh, if he if he can't answer your some of your questions, but you still have some questions, please talk to us again. Um, we are available. Let's let's do it tomorrow. Um, so everyone is like be like very fresh, um, starting from one until nine p.m. Um, just go ahead to Zoom or again, more, you are also more than welcome to email us. Santika, do you have any other last words that you want to share, or are we pretty much good to go? I love this session already. There are so many questions yeah. on top of that fifteen most frequently asked questions so trust me yeah there are so many other questions but yeah thank you so much everybody for um joining in if you're in zoom or if you're in facebook twitter youtube really appreciate your time and please stay tuned to our upcoming events we are we are we will provide you with more awesome events. So for example, I just going to give you a heads up. So for, to, for, for next week, we're going to have an event for those of you who already get accepted. Or if you have not get accepted, but you want to know what are the next steps, uh, feel, uh, stay tuned to our events as well for that. All right. Thank you guys so much. And uh, Santika, do you have any last words? Yeah. So um, I really liked the session because in the beginning of the session, I got a very good news from one of the participants here in Zoom. His name is Tommy. He got accepted in uh, one of the good university in the United States. Uh, he got accepted to Columbia. So congrats, Tommy. And I hope this can be a booster for your um, you know, motivation to plan your study to US and come and find us in Zoom from 1 until 9 p.m. Fina and me will be on standby uh, just for you, right? And I will post the Zoom ID and the link in the chat box so you can copy paste it. If you missed it, you can just email us and schedule for one with us. So uh, that's from me. We actually have one more question from Amelia, but um, her question is uh, about transcript. So she asked uh, the transcript could be in Bahasa Indonesia or bilingual. Well, to answer that question, it really depends on the school. Each school have different uh, report or official uh, record that they will give to you in Bahasa or in English. So if you got it in Bahasa, but you want to translate it to English, you can uh, try to find a sworn translator from the U.S. Embassy list. Uh, if you cannot find it on your own, uh, you can email me or uh, Zoom us, right? We will give it to you right away. All right. I hope that's answer, uh, Amelia. And that's the last question that we can cover today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and we hope this is helpful. And um, we realized we actually have more FAQ than more than 15, right, after this, Vina? Wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and real quick, I would also like to uh, congratulate Tommy again, along with the other 38 um, people who contacted us and they said they also got accepted. Um, it's counting, there are more and more people actually get accepted. So for those of you who actually also want to be um, accepted to your dream universities and you're in the process, um, and but you need you know, like extra guidance, um, please contact us again. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Um, we are expecting more questions from you guys via email or via Zoom tomorrow. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. And I'll give you back to Fifi. All right. Thank you, Fina and Santika, for sharing the great session tonight. And of course, for answering all of the questions from our participants. All right, guys. So earlier in the event, uh, we asked you guys, how many education USA centers are there in Indonesia? And the correct answer is eight. Yes, the correct answer is eight. There is eight education USA centers are there in Indonesia. So uh, shout out to Alfat Eka Liani for answering correctly. Correct. Congratulations to Alfat Eka Liani. So thank you to everyone who has participated. Don't forget to tune in next time and catch a chance to get shout out from us. Now, you may be wondering how can you develop an awesome idea for a place like this. Don't worry, you can send an even proposal to us by visiting our website at www.adamerica.or.id. Select create a program and go to collaborate with us. All proposals coming to us will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. So you can also subscribe to our newsletter for all of our weekly events update that will be sent straight to your inbox. All right, that wraps this episode. It has been fun, folks, but unfortunately, we have to say goodbye for now. Don't forget to follow our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at AdAmerica for all of our events, updates, fun content, and so much more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us, and see you next time on AdAmerica TV. Bye-bye.